At the core of every individual lies their sense of identity and self-worth, which shapes their perception of themselves and their place in the world. Identity is a complex interplay of personal experiences, cultural background, values, and beliefs. It answers the fundamental question of, who am I? On the other hand, self-worth is an evaluation of one's own worthiness and value. It's the internal barometer that dictates how one feels about themselves, irrespective of external validation. A strong sense of identity and self-worth empowers individuals, making them resilient in the face of challenges and confident in their decisions. Conversely, a shaky sense of self-worth can make one susceptible to external influences, constantly seeking validation and approval from others. Over time, these internal perceptions shape one's actions, reactions, relationships, and even aspirations. Do you have a passion for sharing captivating stories? Have you ever considered launching your own podcast or channel to bring content to life? Or maybe you were already an established content creator looking to increase your efficiency. If so, today's sponsor is a game changer for both current and aspiring content creators like you. Meet Avi, the ultimate voiceover cleanup solution tailored for content creators. Avi revolutionizes your content creation process, making it seamless and efficient. All you need to do is upload your raw audio file to Avi's platform, and their state-of-the-art AI technology will work its magic. Avi effortlessly removes pauses, duplicate words, and other imperfections, delivering perfect audio every time. And the best part is that it's free to try. I have personally used Avi and can confirm that it is a game changer. Making videos has never been easier. With Avi, you can focus on what truly matters, researching, scripting, and narrating the enthralling stories that keep your audience on the edge of their seats. Let Avi handle the technical side of things so you can unleash your creativity. Visit avi.ai to learn more and experience the magic of flawless audio. Link in the description below. Now let's dive back into the video. In today's video, we will look at JC Wasso, a self-proclaimed psychic, delving into her intriguing methods and the profound impact she had on the lives of those she encountered. The sun casts a warm glow over Tampa, Florida. The city is bustling with activity, but in the midst of the urban hustle and bustle, there's a story unfolding that no one is yet aware of. Lynn Hawthorne, a young Israeli woman, works at a kiosk in the mall. She's far from home, trying to make a living and find her place in this foreign land. One day while working, she had a chance encounter with J.C. Wasso, a self-proclaimed psychic and spiritual advisor. J.C. saw Lynn crying and approached her, sensing a darkness and a curse that supposedly plagued Lynn's family for generations. This meeting would set Lynn on a path that would intertwine her fate with Richard's. Richard Rappaport, a gentleman in his 70s, strolls through the International Mall. He's a man of means, having made his fortune from Panther Medical, a medical device company he started decades ago. Despite his wealth, Richard leads a modest life. His greatest joys come from staying fit and donating generously to various charities, especially those connected to his Jewish heritage. But there's a void in his life, a longing for companionship. As Richard walked past Lynn's kiosk, their eyes met. There's an instant connection. Lynn's Israeli background and Richard's deep connection to Israel and his faith made their bond even stronger. They start spending time together, sharing stories and getting to know each other. Richard, ever the gentleman, tries to help Lynn find a way to stay in the country legally. The advice they receive points towards marriage as a potential solution. Behind the scenes, J.C. Wasso continues to exert her influence over Lynn. Their relationship, which began with a simple psychic reading, has now evolved into something more manipulative. J.C. constantly texts Lynn, guiding her actions, especially concerning Richard. She advises her to act as if he is her soulmate. She states, kiss him, we need money from him soon. Lynn, caught in JC's web of deceit, starts to believe in the darkness and curse that JC speaks of. She becomes more and more dependent on JC's guidance, even as she grows closer to Richard. They share intimate moments, dinners, and conversations. Richard, ever the generous soul, tries to help Lynn in any way he can, but JC's influence is ever present, guiding Lynn's every move and decision. In the shadows, J.C. Wasso's greed grows. 
she sees Richard not as a kind-hearted elderly man, but as a means to an end. Her messages to Lynn become more insistent, more demanding. Quote, we can't lose him, she writes. Cry to him. Ask him how his money means more than your life. Unbeknownst to Richard, a storm is brewing. Lynn, torn between her genuine affection for him and the manipulative grip of JC, is at a crossroads. The stage is set for a tale of deception, manipulation, and a crime that will shock the city of Tampa. As time progresses, Lynn's trust in JC deepens, and she finds herself handing over increasing amounts of money to rid herself of the alleged curse. The amount starts small, but soon escalate into thousands. JC's manipulation is evident in the barrage of text messages exchanged between the two, with JC constantly pressuring Lynn to give her more, to trust her implicitly, and to follow her every instruction. Their bond grows, and Richard becomes a significant figure in Lynn's life. However, JC sees this as an opportunity. Through Lynn, she aims to access Richard's wealth, urging Lynn to deepen her relationship with him. She instructs Lynn on how to behave around Richard, urging her to be flirty, to kiss him, and to extract as much money as possible. Lynn, once a believer in JC's psychic abilities, now finds herself trapped doing JC's bidding and funneling Richard's money into JC's pockets. JC has convinced Lynn that the money is needed to rid her of her curse, to carry out a ceremony involving an egg and cash. The culmination of this elaborate con is in the form of a staggering $1 million. Richard, for his part, remains an unsuspecting victim. His genuine affection for Lynn blinds him to what's unfolding behind the scenes. As the story unfolds, it becomes evident that this is not just a tale of greed, but also a vulnerability, trust, and the lengths to which one person will go to manipulate another. In the spacious office of a prominent bank, the phone rings, interrupting the calm ambiance. The bank's senior consultant, James, picks up the phone. It's Amber, the branch manager from one of the Tampa locations. Her voice is tinged with concern as she relays an unusual situation. There's a customer here, she starts, expecting a wire transfer of a million dollars. Once it's in, they want the entire amount in cash she states. James raises an eyebrow. Such a request is not only rare, but also riddled with red flags. Recalling his days of consulting for the consumer banking branches in Tampa, James had often provided guidance on operations, compliance, and regulations, but this situation was different. Deciding to see it for himself, he headed over to the branch. Upon his arrival, Amber introduces him to the customer. With the bank's reputation and customers' well-being at stake, James consults with his higher-ups. After a thorough discussion, they reach a unanimous decision. Not only will the transaction be denied, but all banking business related to Richard will also be terminated. It's a stern measure, but the circumstances demand it. James takes it upon himself to convey the bank's decision to Richard. He suggests that the elderly gentleman come in person to close the account and collect a cashier's check for the balance. It's a safer and more practical alternative to the massive cash withdrawal that had been demanded. In the weeks that follow, the incident becomes a hot topic among James's colleagues. They unanimously acknowledge the importance of vigilance, especially with large financial transactions. John Granser, a member of the Roma community, finds himself entangled in a complex web of financial transactions and cultural practices. John is friends with an associate, Joseph, that owns a check cashing establishment. The Roma community to which Joseph belongs is described as tight-knit, with a rich cultural heritage tracing back to India and spanning across Europe. Within this community, arranged marriages are common and business dealings are often kept within the group. John had reached out to an associate to cash Lynn's check because within their community, there's a preference for dealing in cash rather than going through banks. John receives a check in Lynn and Richard's name for $333,333.33. All that is required to cash the check is a form of identification. The associate, familiar with the Roma community's practices and having dealt with them for years, doesn't question the authenticity of the check or the reasons behind cashing it. The identification is provided, albeit in the form of copies. 
the associate having a history of business dealings with the Roma community doesn't push further. All said and done, this is ultimately how Lynn's checks were cashed. After this went on for some time, in the end, one of the bank employees grew suspicious of the failed attempt at cashing the large check. The authorities were alerted and an investigation began. A statewide prosecutor discovered evidence backing up Lynn's story and in August 2020, the psychic JC was arrested. She is now facing several charges, including organized fraud and grand theft. As the trial unfolds, the prosecution presents a compelling narrative. They contend that JC masterminded a scheme, exerting pressure and manipulating Lynn into siphoning funds from her husband, Richard. The prosecution emphasizes that JC was the primary beneficiary of the stolen money, while Lynn was under the impression that these funds would pave the way for a better life. Conversely, the defense paints a different picture. They posit that JC merely safeguarded the checks on Lynn's behalf. The defense suggests that Lynn, driven by fear for her family's safety, intended to stash away some funds as a security measure. They argue that JC neither orchestrated nor profited from these transactions. It was Lynn who truly benefited from this alleged extortion. Additionally, the defense sheds light on JC's upbringing as a gypsy, emphasizing her subservience to her mother's directives which often centered around money-making endeavors. Now, let's take a closer look at the testimony of the victim, Richard. The room is tense as he begins to recount his interactions with a woman named Lynn. He recalls the first time they met at the International Mall. He was there to fix his cell phone at the Apple store and was told to wander around while waiting. As he meandered through the mall, Lynn approached him, drawing him in with her products and her noticeable accent. When he inquired, she revealed that she was from Israel a fact that immediately endeared her to Richard due to his strong zoniest beliefs. We will hear Richard recount the day that he met Lynn. In 2018, did you meet a young lady, maybe even 17, meet a young lady by the name of Lynn Alpha? Yes. Do you remember where it was that you met her? International Mall. Why were you at the mall? Right. My cell phone was down and I was there uh, to go to the Apple store. I never go to International Mall, but then I had to go to the Apple store and they said take an hour, wander around the wall and come back. And my life changed. So, and I assume you did that? You walked around the mall? Walked around the mall. And is that during the time period that you met Ms. Halpa? Yes. How did you meet her? Well, <laughs> I was minding my own business, just walk, walking along when she approached me uh, and asked me if I would uh, look at her product. And had you ever seen her before that day? No. Did you stop and look at the products that she was selling? Yes, I did. Was there anything about her accent that uh, got your attention? Yes, I noticed she had an accent and had a certain look. and. I asked her if she was uh, from Venezuela, and then she told me she was Israeli. And did the fact that she told you that she was from Israel, did that have any particular significance to you? Absolutely. Why so? Uh, because uh, I'm 100% uh, Zionist for the state of Israel. And um, so right away she had credibility. With you? In some respect, yeah. What was your interest in this Alphon? I I thought she was extremely well. She's Israeli, so I had a lot to talk to with her. It was no problem for me to communicate with her. Her English was pretty good, and so um, there were things we discussed. Uh, the fact that she had served in the IDF, and I'm a supporter of that. So uh, in any event. Um, there was a lot to talk about. She traveled to South America to do skydiving. I was interested in that. It's just a lot to talk about. I found her fascinating and interesting. And, uh, you know, we have the same religion. And, you know, it, it, just, it just clicked a little bit there. Their relationship quickly blossomed from there. They dined together, discussing various topics, from her service in the Israel Defense Forces to her travels in South America. Richard found her fascinating and felt a connection, especially given their shared religion. However, as time went on, Lynn began to ask for financial assistance. 
She spun tales of her mother's cancer and her father's gambling debts, stories that Richard, despite his reservations, didn't challenge. He even recalls asking her for hospital bills to verify her claims, but they never materialized. Richard recounts the times that Lynn started asking for money. Note the visible internal turmoil that Richard is experiencing as he reflects on his gullible nature. Did, did she begin to ask you for money? Um, yeah, I don't remember the first time she directly asked me for money. It was more like it, in a, you know, the sequence of events over the years, uh, last three years, has kind of gotten a little hazy in my mind, you know, at what time we did this and that. But in any event, uh, we became good friends. Uh, she also was into, uh, you know, uh, uh, yoga, which I like, and she was into uh, uh, physical training, and I got her a trainer. And uh, what else? Uh, you know, eventually, uh, after this, uh, it somehow it led to the, you know, me getting her her own apartment. Yeah. Did did she at some time during your relationship with her tell you that her mother was sick? She told me her mother had cancer at some point. Did you believe her? You know, I've had experience uh, with uh, women from other countries that have made that claim to get money. <clears throat> I didn't really believe it, but I, I, something about Lynn, I didn't want to call her on it. Did you give her money for her family because her mother, she, she told you her mother had cancer? Not specific. Well, I remember telling hey Lynn, listen, um, have your doctor send me some hospital bills, okay? Have them send me some hospital I'll help you out. I'll help you out with this. said, oh, Ricky, you know, uh, it's too much money. So send me some hospital bills. Because at that point, I wanted to, you know, see it. See that it was a real story. <clears throat> well, we never got the bills. And then the issue came up where her father was being pursued by Israeli gangsters over a gambling debt, and she needed money to to smooth that out, to make that go away. Did you give her money for that too? I gave her money for that. Did you and give her again, money? Again, I was like, you know. No, I don't. What do you mean? You know, it was one of those things that uh, just didn't uh, add up. But with Lynn, uh, I just didn't want to call her on things. I, you know, I had to say, I had to say why. And, looking back, seeing what it developed, you know. Hard to, you know, believe in myself that I didn't call her out on several occasions like that. As their relationship deepened, Richard provided Lynn with access to his credit cards. He didn't scrutinize the bills closely until she was incarcerated. It was then that he noticed extravagant expenses, including lavish meals and jewelry purchases. He felt betrayed realizing that many of the charges were made without his knowledge or consent. In an attempt to support Lynn's dreams, Richard also recalls opening a joint business account with Lynn. She had aspirations in the fashion industry and had conceptualized a unique line of leggings. They even consulted market research companies and industry experts. Richard's primary motivation was to see her happy and to help her realize her goals. However, as he delves deeper into his testimony, it becomes evident that Richard's trust was exploited. He reflects on the numerous times he should have called her out on her inconsistencies, but chose not to. He admits to being blinded by his affection for her and his desire to help. The weight of his decisions weighs heavily on him, especially given his age and the realization that he was taken advantage of. She begged me not to go when I gave her some money at TD Bank. And then I told her, I gotta go, I gotta go, we're leaving at the plane, you know, so. And she was hysterical, basically. How much money did you give her? 80,000. 80,000? Correct. Was that in cash? Yes. Why did you give her $80,000 in cash? Why did I give her $80,000? Now it's easy to reflect on that and not understand, you know, why I did that. Again, why I didn't call, call her on things. 
you but uh, you know, she kept talking about her father being a deep doo doo as a result of uh, having bad gambling debts, and this was going to bail him out. And again, you know, she was kind of hysterical. And you fell for it? Yes, I fell. Hook, line, and sinker. Mr. Rappaport, if you had known what Lynn Halfong was doing with the money that you were providing her with, Yes. And that she was giving it to a psychic. No. Would you have given it to her? No, no, no way. This testimony paints a picture of an elderly man's trust, kindness, and desire to help being manipulated by a younger woman with ulterior motives. Next, the victim's wife, a woman with a complex past, takes the stand. She begins by recounting her early life in Israel, a detail that seems to catch the attention of many. She confirms her Israel citizenship and delves into her mandatory military service, where she worked in security and occasionally assisted in bringing reserve soldiers back to the military. She speaks of her close-knit family, emphasizing her strong bond with her parents and two sisters. The questioning takes a turn when she's asked about her experiences with psychics or mediums. She's hesitant, then recalls a time in Israel when she sought therapy from someone who claimed to have special abilities. This therapist, she says, was more about conversation and emotional support than any supernatural insights. Her emotional state becomes a focal point. She admits to feeling emotionally unstable at one point, which led her to seek therapy. The reason? She was introduced to the idea of evil spirits by none other than the defendant, J.C. Wasso. The wife paints a picture of a vulnerable time in her life when she was easily influenced by J.C leading her to genuinely fear these spirits. A particularly poignant moment comes when she recalls a day at the mall when she meets Richard. She felt things weren't going as planned. Loneliness weighed heavily on her, and she yearned for a soulmate, a desire that remained unfulfilled. Throughout her testimony, the wife's complex relationship with the truth becomes evident. While she may be a victim in some respects, her own actions and decisions have played a role in the events that unfolded. We will hear Lynn describe the first time she met with JC. The hope was to better her life and grow as an individual. After the first visit, Lynn was told she had a curse and it would cost $600 to get rid of it. Then JC gave her specific instructions involving an egg and $200 in cash. Now, what did you get for your $100 on this first visit? Nothing really. She let me, she gave me like, no, nothing basically. Did you have to fill out any paperwork? Yes. So she gave me a paperwork to fill out, and she asked me like to put all the, my information. What information was she requesting in this paperwork? I remember it was the eye color, my date of birth, my name, my zodia. Yes. Was there any information requested about your family and the number of? Uh, whether they were still living or not, or the children, any, uh, I mean, not children, but brothers or sisters? I don't remember. I remember that it was very, like, like not many questions. It was pretty... More personal to you? Yes. Now, about how long did this initial visit for $100 last? Can you ask it again, please? Yeah, how long did it last? How long did the it meeting? take the first time you went? It wasn't long, like 30 minutes maybe, even less, it was very short. Were any plans made for another contact between you and J.C. Watson? Yes. And what was the reason for the second contact? Um, basically to give her $600, as she asked me to. What were you supposed to get for your six hundred dollars? Because she told me that the course we was talking about before, like the course she curse? told me, yeah, the course she told me about before, is much stronger than she thought it is because she meditated on it and she understood that the course is very, very big and very dangerous. So she have charge members that she and the charge members 
need to work all night to meditate on it to take it away. And so she needed $600 for that? Yes. And another visit? Yes. Me to take an egg, to put the egg, to choose, like to take the tab of the eggs, to choose from there one egg, to, to, to take the egg, to put it in a paper towel to make sure that this towel is going to be white, to wrap it, to put it in a bag, and to sleep with the egg under my, under my bed. Sorry, it's not a bag, I don't need to put on the bag, but I need the egg to put with a white paper to put it under my bed. Did she tell you whether you needed to put anything on your body? Yes, she told me to take $200 to take them like this together, to put them like together that way. I remember she told me to wrap them and to put it on my bra. In your bra? Yeah. Were you supposed to sleep with the $200 as well? Yes, I did. Now that Lynn believes she has a curse, she has to go back to JC for another visit so she can perform a ceremony. The ritual is intended to rid Lynn of the curse and help her better her life. Lynn explains what happens during the ceremony. It's interesting to note the face she makes when discussing the use of leaves and JC placing her hand on Lynn's head. Lynn's reaction while recounting this reveals that she thinks this is weird. However, when discussing an exploding egg and cash on her chest, she is not phased. So I went there, um, I went inside. She, in the first time, she, in the first place, she told me to wait to her outside. Then she told me that she's ready. I got inside. She took me to the room, the original room. And then she told me that she wanted to introduce me her mother. Up to this point, you had not met anybody but her? No. Now, what did this room that she took you into look like? The room looks like a lot of crystals, Buddha things, um, everything looks like, you know, spiritual objects, if it's right to say that that way. Was there any, did you go there in the daytime or was it nighttime? It was nighttime at that time. Were there any, now, after you're in the room with the two of them, was anybody else in the room besides the three of you? No. You had the egg with you? Yes, I did. You had the money? in your bra? Yes, I did. The $200? Yes, I did. Now, what happened after you go into the room with, with uh, Miss Wasso and her mother? So she introduced me her mother. They both sit with me. They start sitting and talk to me. And mother start to ask me many questions about me, about my life, about talking about my insecurities, my problem in life, about my course that I have in my family, about the demons about all the bad things that had happened to me and about all the good things that may happen to me, that are going to happen to me in the future because they are helping me to get this out. So there is a very excitement future for me, waiting for me. Ceremony, and they explained me that they are going to do in the ceremony, they're going to take the evil, or the course that there is on my family, they're going to take it off from the egg, that this is what the egg is here for, that I'm going to crush it and they're supposed to be like something black. Like I remember that there was instructions and she explained me everything and she told me that she hoped that this black thing gonna go out because it may not go out and if it's not gonna go out so all this is not wor like it didn't work and we just we need to continue praying and I really hope that it's gonna get out because you know I wanted the course to go out for me. Now, for my family. When you're in the room... First of all, she put me, like, the start, like, to... They took, like, um, leaves, like, weird leaves, and they start to, like, praying on me and turn around me, and they're, like, they put, like, a hand here and here, and they start, like, to mess with me and, like, start to say, like, you need to, to breathe in and breathe out. And when you breathe in, you breathe in the good energy. When you breathe out, you breathe out all the bad energy, all the demons, all the bad things that are inside of you. And you did that? And I did it. What happened to the egg? And then they told me to crush the egg with my right leg. And then I did it. What happened? 
there was a black thing going out from the air. All of this comes at a cost, and quickly the amounts that are required for Lynn to bring with her to the appointments grows. Hundreds turn into thousands, which turn into a million. Lynn does anything JC says and never questions her methods. Lynn even brings JC jewelry to help rid her of the curse. Lynn explains her perception of what JC does with the money and why larger amounts are required. She's basically working on an amount of money and she needs to sacrifice it. And she works on that amount. That's how she described it to me on my mind. She's working on it. And if I'm not going to get the full amount that the spirits want, the other half that she already worked in, it will burn. And we cannot use nothing anymore. Like, she cannot, we cannot use the half. That's how she described it to me. It's not, like, no, literally, like, I'm just not going to use this amount because it didn't give the full amount. So we cannot use it anymore. Like, we're not going to be able to use it. I don't know, maybe she did mend it, but I didn't understand it that way. In the courtroom, the prosecution stands, ready to deliver their closing arguments. They begin by painting a vivid picture of manipulation, greed, and the undue pressure exerted by JC. The jury listens intently as they are reminded of how JC continuously pressured Lynn, pushing her to extract money and jewelry. This isn't just about a fee for service, the prosecutor declares. They question the very essence of the transactions, suggesting that bringing large sums of money to a spiritual advisor was not a genuine spiritual consultation, but a well-orchestrated con job. They remind the jury of the suspicious activities surrounding the checks, the involvement of various shadowy figures, and the attempts to cash vast sums of money. While Lynn may have been a victim to some extent, she was also an accomplice. After being incarcerated for 13 months on charges of swindling a million dollars from her spouse, Lynn accepted a plea agreement, leading to her deportation to Israel. JC, on the other hand, faced a more severe consequence. She received a sentence of nine and a half years behind bars, followed by a 15-year probation period. She has also been prohibited from practicing fortune-telling in the future. What could have led JC to extort so much money? And what leads someone to believe they are cursed? Cultural and familial contexts play a profound role in shaping an individual's sense of self-worth. In many traditional societies, an individual's value is often equated with their tangible contribution to the family, especially in terms of financial support. Growing up in such an environment, JC would have internalized the idea that her identity and self-worth were directly tied to her financial contributions. This belief system can create an immense internal pressure, where one's self-esteem is contingent upon their ability to generate income. For JC, this could mean that the act of earning, even if it involved manipulation or extortion, was not just a means to an end, but a validation of her identity. Humans are inherently social beings, seeking connections, validation, and support from those around them. When an individual feels isolated, whether emotionally, physically, or both, they become more susceptible to external influences, especially those that promise understanding support, or solutions to their problems. For Lynn, if she felt a lack of genuine connections or lacked a robust support system, it might have created a void, a space where she felt alone in her fears and uncertainties. This isolation can magnify perceived threats, making them seem even more daunting than they truly are. In such a state, an individual might become more reliant on any source of guidance or solace, even if it's from someone with ulterior motives. JC's influence on Lynn can be seen in this light. In the absence of alternative perspectives or voices of reason, Lynn might have found herself more dependent on JC's guidance, making her more susceptible to manipulation and further deepening her sense of isolation from those who might have offered genuine support. This was intensified for Lynn as she was living in a foreign country without her family or friends. These are not excuses for Lynn or JC's actions, but rather giving us an understanding of where they might have been mentally or how they would have gotten to the place of extorting so much money. Should Lynn have been more responsible 
Or was JC truly the mastermind? Why do you think Richard trusted Lynn so wholeheartedly, despite the red flags? We want to give a big thanks to everyone over on Patreon. We want to give a big shout out to Nexus, Big Pepperoni Pizza, Chrissy R, Catherine D, Tony S, Tiffany D, Dolce P, and Emily H. If you want to watch ad-free and uncensored versions of all Wicked videos, feel free to join our Patreon. Link in the description. Thank you for watching and join us next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.